As someone who was there, the old internet truly did feel like an entirely different beast than what we have now. It felt like reading an infinite book, every website and page like picking up a rock and seeing what's living underneath. Admittedly, some of that was the sheer novelty of it all making it seem more magical, but I feel like the corporatization of the internet really killed the soul of it. Pre-commodified internet is absolutely incredible, a true testament to human nature. It feels like the spirit of humanity enshrined in pixels. I could look at old websites for hours. My fondest memory of the old internet is a mailing list dedicated to an anime I used to love. It was the first time I ever got involved in a fandom, and I made my first internet friends there. We had a ton of fun, talked every day, shared fan art, fan fiction, roleplay, and just fun conversations. It all began to dwindle till no one replied anymore, and mailing lists stopped being a thing. I still remember them very fondly. Our journey into the depths of the old internet was a really special experience, and it appears we were not alone in this feeling that it gave. Seeing a place we all use every single day look so different was an eye-opening and nostalgic adventure despite the fact that we unfortunately didn't even live through most of it. And due to the unbelievable success that our Exploring the Old Internet video had, it only made sense that we would continue this journey again. The reception, some of which we just read, was greater than we possibly could have ever imagined. If you haven't seen our original Exploring the Old Internet video, I would definitely recommend you to watch that before this one. It explains the background and idea behind this all, as well as what the resource we use for these does. It'll just make a lot more sense if you see that one first. At the end of the last video, we asked people to share what the old internet was like for them, thinking that maybe our video could serve as a place to come together, to recollect, and to discuss this distant memory. And in honor of that idea, perhaps this time we can unearth even more memories for you all. It is time to explore the old internet once again. The resort is a geek house in the mountains of Santa Cruz, California. We are a fully network connected household of seven housemates who employ the full power of the internet to nag our housemates about chores and otherwise organize our lives. We've been the resort since 1992 and online full time since 1994. In the future, all houses will be like the resort. However, it is likely that the people in this future will be so busy forwarding mail to their housemates that they will forget to eat and will thus die. In clicking the Geek House link, it states that a Geek House is pretty much a home comprised almost entirely of computer nerds. And along with that definition, it says that there are a number of these houses in the Santa Cruz area. And below this, it shows pretty much all of them that are known. I tried to click some of these other clickable pages for the supposed other Geek Houses, and unfortunately it seems that the vast majority of these links are dead, but I did find a few that worked. One of them was the Abattoir, and wow, is this website colorful. Residents of the Abattoir are heavily armed at all times and will kill intruders on sight. Happy New Year! Of the few other links I found, most of them were naturally pretty personal, with photos of these house inhabitants and not much else. But this whole geek house section certainly explains what the resort is all about. With the way everything on the resort site is written, you can tell that a lot of it is comprised of in-jokes and the things that only other people in the resort would probably understand fully. There's a place called Meet the Resort that explains the origins of this place and how it came to be. 7 bedroom, 3 bathroom, 2600 square foot on 2 acre pool spa. 1992. Who wouldn't jump at a chance to live somewhere like that? The resort was formed when Saulgood and Banshee decided that they needed to stop living in small houses and furthermore needed to establish a geek house of unparalleled magnitude. They had lived in the Parrington dorm for 4 years at UCSC and had lived in separate houses in Santa Cruz for a few years. Banshee really wanted to live in the woods and Saulgood really wanted a geek house. So Banshee found this ad in the classifieds that appeared to have everything they both wanted. Privacy, for setting, lots of space, lots of bedrooms, a pool, and a spa. Though their current housemates were rather displeased, they went ahead and tried to organize a motley crew to secure this wilderness retreat. They pulled in Fez, a friend from work who had gotten tired of living alone. They pulled in Pickery and Vag, with whom Banshee had spent much of the spring of 92 getting trashed. LaFole was a friend from Parrington looking for inexpensive housing. Angel was a friend from the UCSC computer system who wanted a housing change. With these seven assembled and much bickering about who was to buy the toilet paper later, the resort was born. To me, there's just something really sweet about seeing a group of younger people dream of all living together actually making that happen, and then opening a website to document all about it. And the fact that they still may be living there all these years later only adds to this.
This is certainly one of the eeriest websites I've come across so far during this journey, and it's also a rare website that is clearly very new too. The contents of the site is just a YouTube link. The site is called spotthedrowningchild.com. The video in question also bears the same name, and in it you, well, do just that. The video in question has a fixed camera of a wave pool with dozens and dozens of people in view, except at one point, one of the kids begins drowning, which is spotted by the lifeguard almost instantly who jumps in and saves the kid. Being posted on a channel called Lifeguard Rescue, I think this video was made to show how important lifeguards can really be, and it also shows how difficult the job can be. There were so many people in view that it seems very, very difficult to pay perfect attention to them all, especially when drowning can be so quiet. But this lifeguard saw it instantly and saved a life. The description of the video says, Peer pressure in pools can lead to dangerous situations. The person who winds up being rescued is just trying to make it back to his girlfriend. Instead of asking for help, which would have been embarrassing, he decided to chance it. This is a good example of someone who goes vertical and can't make any meaningful swimming motions. Next up, we have Wobbletown. It appears as if this website is about a specific type of virtual pet. As we can see, there is a current population of 76 of them, all in different shapes and sizes. Clicking each of them also gives information about every individual creature, and even more interestingly, an entire different look to the webpage in question. Many of them appear to have been abandoned, and it looks like you can even feed these abandoned ones even if they aren't yours. In going to the Wobbletown manual, we can learn more. We don't know much about what exactly wobbles are or where they come from. They have been discovered for the first time when Brood, as he walked back home in the early morning after spending the night at the midnight pub, saw a weird looking egg near a pond in Dusk's End, Nightfall City. That night, Brood might have had one too many drinks, he didn't know if he was hallucinating. But then the egg hatched and a funny looking creature just came out. It wobbled as it tried to stand up. Soon after, Brood realized that there were many eggs all around this pond. He decided to call this place Wobble Town and to tell all his friends about it so they can care for those little wobbly creatures. Below it we can read that these creatures need to be fed about every 24 hours, and that they'll leave after 5 days without any food. It also shows us that this website was heavily inspired by Tamagotchis, which is something I was already thinking about. There's even a lab section of the site that gives you even more lore. If I'm being honest, I have absolutely no idea how old or new this website really is. With just a select amount of creatures there, this place certainly seems very hidden compared to most of the internet. It looks like it was most likely made less than 10 years ago, but maybe just like the Wobblers themselves, it's hundreds of years old, reaching beyond the internet entirely. And speaking of online websites, here is Nightfall.org, one of the coolest websites I've found out of all of them so far. Nightfall is one of the oldest multi-user dungeons still alive, running continuously since 1993, while first opening to the public in 1990. MUDs are text-based multiplayer online games to check out the enormous landscape Nightfall has to offer. Connect to Nightfall.org at port 4242 using your favorite Telnet client. Have a look at our description of various clients or use the web client. If you want to get a feel without connecting now, the guide might be an interesting read. And of course, you are welcome to check out our notes on the different races, guilds, and history, pasts and present. For the impatient, the map of Nightfall is especially worth seeing. There is a short quick smart manual available as well as a rather extensive introduction to Nightfall and MUDs in general. As someone very unfamiliar with games like this, it definitely was a bit overwhelming, but the amount of information in depth available is simply astounding. There's tons of other sections too one of which showing who is online right now. With an over 20 year old game that looks like this, even though there aren't many, there's something really sweet to me about the fact that there are still people around playing it to this day. And you can even click these users to learn a little bit more about them. If you go back to the homepage and click the don't panic button, I realize that you can explore the game a little as a guest, so that's what I'm gonna do. As you can see, you're actually given a character selection screen, so I'm going to select North. And then I'm going to select Become Male. Now we are given multiple character options. I can be a Dark Elf, a Demon, a Dwarf, a Troll. In honor of this channel's history, I'm going to become a Gnome.
After this, it seems that I would be able to start playing the game. Even though text-based games are primitive by their nature, I find a certain beauty in them due to the fact that you have no choice but to use your imagination through the majority of these scenarios. I'm not sure if this is a game I would actually sit down and play like that, but it's still something I respect and appreciate, especially because they don't really exist anymore. If any of these websites could serve as a reminder to what the old internet was like, this is probably it. Today I could lose myself in a world like Fallout, but back then, this was the world. It clearly has just as much depth, probably more honestly, but what we see in front of us is all there is, and all that anybody else playing with you could see as well. The world came alive through your imagination, and the online aspect was likely even more intimate. And once again, it still seems to be living on in a way, even if it is now small. Next up is a really important one. Here we have the true story of Idaho. This is an essay created for the sole purpose of proving that Idaho is not in fact a real state, and let me just say, it's pretty convincing. Do you know anybody from Idaho? Do you know anybody who knows anybody from Idaho? According to the 1990 census, there are over 1 million people living in Idaho. But if there are so many Idahoers, where are they? Some people have come forward and claimed that they were born and raised in Idaho, but every single person who made this claim have been shown to be frauds and charlatans. These Idaho and wannabes are invariably inconsistent with each other about the size in square miles or square kilometers of Idaho, about various town and village names, and even about the names of Idaho's mighty rivers. There's sections about satellite evidence, photographic evidence, the potato myth, and so much more. I don't know what made this man want to dig into Idaho so badly, but it was a truly hilarious read, and another moment that just made you think, how many websites exist anymore with the sole purpose of something this small and kinda just funny? At the bottom of the page we have a section that brings us back to Carl's homepage, and we can now see that he actually makes map art, many of which are actually being used on major websites. I can only assume that all the maps he made, none of them are Idaho. And well, if we're not going to Idaho, how about we just leave this planet entirely? If you ever wanted a place for that, we may have found one. This is Alien Ground. Really, it's a simple but super charming place. It's all about giving you some free gifts and wallpapers all relating to UFOs or aliens. And all of them are just really charming, old school 3D art. We've got some UFOs flying over houses, planets orbiting, gifts for your email, and Goku? Well, you can definitely say this place has variety. Finally, we'll explore EvilOverlord.com, a place made by a true internet supervillain. This website is all about the top 100 things that this person would do if he was an evil overlord, but most of them are the small inconveniences that are of course so much worse than anything else. Things like, my ventilation ducts will be too small to crawl through, or I will never utter the sentence, but before I kill you, there's just one thing I want you to know. All the weird cliches would not be happening with this guy in charge. On the cell block A and B links, you get even more evil overlord scenarios. At the bottom of the site, it appears as if this website had won some awards in the past. It was given Cruel Sight of the Day in 1996 and Worst of the Web in 1997. At the bottom of the page, we can go to the Evil Overlord homepage, which includes a message from the Evil Overlord CEO. So in case you ever wanted to study up on what it may take to become a true Evil Overlord, that is the place to go. As this video begins to come to a close, once again, all of these websites we visited reinforced all the key points and ideas we talked about last time. It showed us that there was a time where the internet wasn't very corporate, a time where sites were mostly made out of passion and of sharing your interests, or just simply having fun. And this fact was what made the old internet feel so special. All these things are true, but these are also all things we've clearly gone over. Many comments in our last video mentioned taking things about the internet we have today and combining it with the old internet that felt so special. But if the old internet was this incredible, why would you take any aspect of the internet we have today with us? Well, even though so many things about the old internet appear to be beautiful to my eyes and to the eyes of many, it's important to not wear totally rose-colored glasses either. For even at this time, there were of course negatives. Obviously loading times were bad, but this isn't what we were referring to. 
A big positive for the old internet was that feeling of freedom it gave. Anything was possible in this new revelation. Anybody could create anything they wanted. In many ways, this was an absolute blessing and created the magic we look back on now. But in certain ways, it could be seen as a curse. The lack of rules meant that it was much easier for shocking content to slip through the cracks. Whether this be terrible violence, hate speech, criminal activity, or the absolute most common offender, sexual content. As far as I have heard, the old internet had so much sexual content on it that in some ways it could be hard to escape it. Because of these things, in a weird way, I always saw the closest place to capturing the atmosphere of the old internet to be none other than 4chan. 4chan is ruthless, really inappropriate, disturbing on occasion, and all of these things, especially on old forum boards, were absolutely prevalent on the old internet. There were many wholesome, passionate websites, sure, but there were also so many websites and places full of shocking discussions, because there was nothing preventing that. Reasons like this are why you have to look at the past in an unbiased manner. In the future, we will cover many more old internet sites, most of them definitely being about the passion, the intrigue, and the beauty that the old internet had to offer. But just remember that if we truly went back to the old internet, these negatives would come with that too. So much of the old internet was about the randomness of it. Randomly stumbling upon a place about somebody super passionate about birds, or randomly finding a website about why Idaho just doesn't exist. But perhaps just as common as that could be, randomly stumbling upon a website full of gruesome deaths or sexual content. And if you were exploring the internet at a younger age, that's something you probably still remember. On the internet today, the randomness that gave so much of this old era its soul is definitely for the most part gone. But as a result of that, it is a lot harder to suddenly stumble upon a place like that. Don't get me wrong, it can still occur, and that content is all still out there. I know that if I scroll through Instagram reels for more than 5 minutes, the odds of me finding a tragic death are going to be way too high. But these things definitely aren't as commonplace as they used to be. And for the most part, you would have to seek these things out rather than it just appearing. Unsupervised internet access still meant that many of us found these horrific things at a young age, but again, those were usually seeked out specifically, which creates an entirely new argument that goes beyond just the internet itself. As it stands, this all seems to be about a balance. People want the soul of the old internet, the explorative and passionate nature of it, but I'm sure we would all like the safety that technological advances have allowed us to have today too. The combination of both really would be the best answer, even if we all know that it will never happen. Because of this, we'll just keep looking back, we'll imagine what it could have been like if these things combined the way we wish it did, and next time we'll explore a web hosting service we've talked about in lengths already, but truly give it its flowers. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure to like this video and subscribe. If you like the channel, make sure to check out our social medias in the description below. Make sure to stop by our Discord, it really is the best place to chat with us and hang out with fellow debunk enthusiasts. Of course, if you'd like to support the channel a little bit more, please head over to our Patreon, Debunk Plus. Only a dollar a month and you guys get access to videos early, script PDFs, whatever random stuff we decide to put up, and more. As always, my name is Seth from Debunk File. See you guys next time. Bye.